Good morning, everyone, for our uh, Sabbath service today. And I am super fired up about being here. And I'm glad everyone can make it today. And, and all of our friends and family online. There's a lot of people online. And it's just been amazing to see God uh, continuously grow uh, the body and grow this ministry. It's just really encouraging because um, he wants his message to get preached around the world. It says Jesus comes back when his message of the kingdom is preached all around the world. And God put that on our heart seven years ago to start learning this stuff and start teaching it. And just up until recently, we haven't really had even the ability to teach it, let alone how to structure it or anything. And God's been, you know, teaching us through these Sabbath days and, and honoring God on his, commandment, on his commandments, his holy days and his Sabbath days. And it's been really encouraging for us. And so um, I'm just going to open it up really quick in prayer and then we're going to dive right in because we have a big message today. Father God, I just want to come to you today. and Thank you so, so, so much for uh, blessing and putting your blessings on this ministry and on the people here. Father, we all love you. We all want to obey you. We all want to, to do what you want us to do and, and obey your scriptures. But most importantly, we want to meet you in the air uh, and go be in the kingdom of God uh, for eternity, Father. That's ultimately what we seek, what we think about. That's our only hope. That's our dream and our goal, Father. So I just pray that today... Um, you can inspire us with how to make that happen, God, what to do to be there with you. So we thank you so much for this time. Give me the words to say and uh, give everyone the heart to want to learn and repent and become closer to you. We love you. It's in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. 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 So I'm going to pass this out. <clears throat> this is going to look like a lot of scripture, but uh, it is. <laughs> and it's okay because uh, this is what God wanted us to learn. So I just want, want you guys to know that I'm really, like I said, I, I'm really excited for this message. Now, one thing I want to share that, um, you know, our, our ministry is Saved by Truth. You can go to SavedByTruth.com and watch, you know, the videos on the message. Um, on, on, you can watch the videos on the website. You can also go to our YouTube channel, which is Saved by Truth 1. So go to YouTube and it's Saved by Truth 1. And the reason why you can go there right now and watch those videos because they're available. Um, in the last few days... I just want to share this. In the last few days, in the last few days, God has put on my heart that um, I need to do something different than what we're doing. I need to do some things differently. And here's why. Because right now we have access to the Internet. We have access to freedoms and liberties that we may not have at one point. And as God was reeling through the scriptures that there's going to come a time where we may not have access for biblical principles or not necessarily just us. But there might be people, let's say when the bride is gone, and we've done scriptures on that messages about the bride being gone before the body, which you'll see that today. But the bride, when it's gone, the people that are left behind are not going to have the ability to go online and learn about God's word because that, that message won't be here no more. It may be taken away. That liberty of getting on the Internet and just watching videos may not be available. So God told me, Stephen, you need to take those videos you've done and reproduce them in a way that's not on the Internet. And I was like, okay, well, what do you mean? What, what do you want me to do? Nobody uses CDs and DVDs anymore. He said, yes, they do, all around the world. <laughs> I said, okay, then what do you want me to do? So a lot of the videos that are online right now are going to still be there, but God asked me to reproduce them into a CD and DVD, into a pack. And, you know, we're going to sell it for like $10 because that's about what it costs plus a little bit. But the bottom line is people, we need to get this message worldwide. So God put it on my heart to take these CDs and take these messages that people need to know about how to make it to the kingdom of God. And some of them, like the hidden feast that we did last week, people need to know what that hidden feast is and how that is so important to make it to the kingdom of God. And, the, you know, the bride makes herself ready. People need to know how to prepare themselves for the bride to be the bride. Or if the bride is gone, then how to be the wedding party. And what happens in the day of atonement? They need to know that. And so that's what those messages teach and teaching things like entering through the narrow gate. What does that mean? People don't understand what that means. Or even the other one we did on the Lord provides how to ask for what you want and really how the Lord will provide for you if you ask and those who are obedient. And then, of course, how to get your sins forgiven. The greatest you know, deceptions, one of the greatest deceptions Satan's done. How do you get your sins forgiven? People need to know that information. And there's many other ones. So I'm going to take as many as I can put on a CD and DVD and it'll be both. So that people can purchase them that are not just us because you'll have it. But there's a lot of people that won't have it. They won't have access to it. And it's been awesome because I met a gentleman who's a marketing genius and we partnered up. And this has been, this been my missing link 
Uh, it's funny, uh, we're doing some business together, and he said yesterday, he goes, man, I can't believe you can do what you do. You complete me. That's what he said. He said, you complete me, because he knows how to drive traffic. He didn't know how to make sales. I know how to make sales. I didn't know how to drive traffic. So it's like a perfect match. And I told him about this mission, and he said, I'm going to help you. <laughs> and so, and there's another brother online right now who does editing, and he said he'd help us. And anyone else that wants to help, um, make, take this mission around the world to get people this knowledge. Because there's a lot of information out there. But people need the knowledge of what God has been teaching us through here. And so I just um, wanted to just share that with you because I'm exci excited. That's part of my good news. Uh, but we're going to dive right into the scriptures. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of scripture, but we'll go through it and it'll seem fast because it's going to be hopefully uh, intriguing for everyone and everyone will really understand what, um, you know, what God wants for our life. So let's go through it. Let's jump right in. We're going to start with um, the question. And the title of the message is, The Questions Are the Answers. How to make it to the kingdom of heaven. Because uh, this, the, the Bible is going to answer the most important question that you should be asking in this life right now. How do we make it to the kingdom of heaven? There should be no more important question that disciples or people that love God should be asking. Not how to have a better life, how to get a more retirement, how to, you know, be more happy and have a better family relationship. All those are important to do. But the single most important message that we should be asking ourselves is how do we make it to the kingdom of heaven? I was talking to a brother the other day, and I called my brother because he used to go to the church that we used to attend. And one of the things that we talked about, because he believes they're in the kingdom of God right now. He believes in the church is the kingdom of God. Then what's coming back down then? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. And the Bible says, and I showed him one scripture, the Bible says flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. So that one scripture takes away that entire thing that someone's in the kingdom of God right now. Because flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nor can the perishable inherit the imperishable. It can't be done. That's what the Bible says. But people believe they're in the kingdom of God. That's not true. The kingdom of God is coming. And we're going to go be with it. And so we need to understand some questions. And so I just asked some questions. I said, God, what do you want me to teach? He said, the questions are the answers. So these are the questions that God put on my heart today. Um, number one is, what does the Lord want for his disciples. So let's look at the scriptures to see what the Bible says the Lord wants for his disciples. 1 Timothy 2, and we're going to start in verse 1. 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 1. Let me make the screen a little bigger for everyone. That's good? Okay. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. It says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all in authority, that we may live in peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. That man is Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been a witness to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed and herald as an apostle. And I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. This is awesome that, you know, he had this heart that, you know, he's telling this message, but the biggest thing that God said here is that he wants all men to come to the knowledge of the truth and to be saved. Two separate things there. He, they, he wants men to be saved and he wants them to come to the knowledge of the truth. If you notice, those are two separate things. One is being saved. One is coming to the knowledge of the truth. Our whole ministry is called Saved by Truth and we teach the truth that a lot of people won't teach. So we need to talk about this because if you look at it, it says, um, and he says that he'd be appointed as, uh, as an apostle. Now, I'm definitely not an apostle because I didn't walk with Jesus, but God has given me the ability to share this message, um, not just to the Gentiles, but to the true Israelites as well. Um, and so it's important, and everyone else for that matter who wants to hear the truth. But the whole point that, that God wants us to know is that he came for two reasons. He, he wants us to come to be saved 
and to the knowledge of the truth. So the question, we, some questions we have to ask ourselves is, what does it mean to be saved? Because people always throw that word around. I'm saved. I'm saved. And this is what it takes to be saved. I'm saved. I'm, everybody's walking around saved. Well, what does being saved actually mean in Scripture? You need to know the answer to that question. Because if you think you're saved, and then when the Bible says something different, you need to rethink your thinking. Because you may, we may not be. You know, Satan's a crafty and he's a deceiver. So let's look at what it means to be saved. Let's look over at Matthew 19. <clears throat> Matthew 19. Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. We've all heard this message before. We're going to read it again. It's talking about the rich, young, rich and the kingdom of God. So all these messages are going to have something to do with the kingdom of God. Because remember, that's the ultimate goal. How do we get there? So this gentleman asked a similar question that I would ask right now. How do we get to the kingdom of God? Look what he says, verse 16. Then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? So that's one of the things it says here um, is how do we get to eternal life? Right? So that's the, the good question that this guy asked. How do I get there? So one of the things about salvation is has to do with eternal life. So if we're looking at the scriptures, it says one of the things to be saved is to get eternal life. You got that? So that's one of the things that we're being saved is eternal life. Uh, and then it says, why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. So we'll talk about that a little later. But that's one of the things he says is if you want to enter eternal life, obey the commandments. Now, we all know those are the Ten Commandments, and here's the proof. Which ones? Same question he asked. Which ones should I honor? Because today, a lot of people think, oh, I need to honor just Jesus' commandments. I need to honor these types of commandments. And, and you know, the, only the new commandment, loving people, is the only thing that you should obey. A lot of people say that. Well, he says, which ones? The same one. Part. And then he says, Jesus replies, you should not commit murder. Where is that found? In the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. Where is that found? In the Ten Commandments. You shall not steal. Where is that found? You shall not give false testimony. So we know what commandments he's talking about. Now he doesn't rattle off all ten. He only rattles off about five. But all ten still apply. So it's very important. That's one of the things he says. It says, honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the Ten Commandments wrapped into the greatest commandment. Okay? All these I have kept. The young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasures in heaven. Okay, what commandment is that? Do not covet. Do not covet. Loving money, right? Idol. And so it's still the commandment, even though he explained it in a sentence form. So you see, then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Look what it says. Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, which means we're not in the kingdom of heaven now. That's coming down the road. It's hard. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for some, a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So just wanted to put these two co combinations together, entering life, in, eternal life, entering life and entering the kingdom of God are all the same thing. Write that down. Very important to understand this. This is very important for you to know these things because there's a lot of deception out there. And it's your job to take notes. It's your job to be a Berean. It's your job to examine the scriptures to make sure what I'm saying is true. So write this down. Write down your notes. So entering life, entering eternal life, and entering the kingdom of God is the same thing. And the kingdom of heaven are all the same. Got that? Very important to grasp, grasp that concept. The next thing we're going to look at is Matthew 7. Let's look over at Matthew 7. Matthew 7. These are some qualities about entering eternal life and what it means to be saved. Here's another quality of that. Matthew 7, starting in verse 13. Matthew 7, starting in verse 13, it says the narrow and wide gates. Okay? Now, of course, that's not scripture, but this is. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. So that's telling you that everyone's not saved. 
And remember, this is only talking to the people that are obeying God and honoring God. It's not talking to the world that don't obey God. It's only talking to the people that believe in God, that want to follow him. It says enter, telling them to enter to, through the narrow gate. And the gate is narrow to them. Make sense? And it says, a min, and many enter through the wide gate. But look what it says about the small gate. But the small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, eternal life. And only a few find it. Did you get that? Only a few find it. We've done messages on this. In the days of Noah, when Noah was building the ark, there was millions of people on the earth, but it says only a few, eight and all, were saved through water. Eight out of millions, that's a small percentage. And every time the word I, I found in, in scripture about this type of topic, when he says few, He's talking about it's a wide road that don't get it and only a few find it. So here's another one. Only a few are on that narrow road. Even though you might believe you're on the narrow road. Believing you're on the narrow road don't make you on the narrow road. You understand? So how do you stay on that narrow road and what does it mean to be saved? That's what we're asking. But this is another quality. You've got to understand that being on the narrow road and eternal life and um, life and, and the kingdom of heaven are all the same. You got it? You got to stay on that narrow road to make it to the kingdom of heaven. So all those go together. So the reason I'm piecing this together is because all this has to come together so you can make sense for you. So let's look at another quality of what salvation is. Because just understanding the word salvation doesn't make you saved. You have to know what it means to be saved. So let's look at Matthew 22, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Matthew 22, starting in verse 1. This is talking about the parable of the wedding banquet. We've read this many times, but it's important to read it from this perspective. And I love the way the Bible, you read something one day, the next day you read it again, it's a different scripture. <laughs> it's amazing how God does that. But look what it says. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Stop right there. So now the king, king of God is like a wedding banquet. So king of heaven and saved is meaning participating in a wedding banquet. You see how that works? See how he's tying all these pieces together? So you want to be at that wedding banquet. Anybody want to be at the wedding banquet? Absolutely. I want to be at the wedding banquet. And I don't care where I'm sitting in the wedding banquet. I just want to be there. Right? Look what it says. It's like a, a, a king who prepared the wedding banquet. Who's the king? God, right. And he prepared a way to make it for who? His son. And who's his son? Yeshua. Yeshua. Who's Jesus' who's Jesus's wife? <laughs> the bride. The bride of Christ. The church. That's why last week's video, we talked about being part of the bride. The bride makes herself ready. That's Jesus' wife. That's the body of Christ. But it's not the whole church like people think it is. But look what it says. He sent out his servants those who had, to those who had been invited to the banquet. And tell them to come, but they refused to come. So he told his disciples, he told his servants to go out and get the, prepare the, the wedding and tell them to come in, but they refused. How do you refuse to come to God's wedding banquet? What kind of ways do you do that? Ignore it. Ignore it too busy. Oh, I don't need to learn anything about the wedding banquet. I'm saved. I'm just saved. I got baptized. I'm saved. I'm good. I don't need to do anything else. You're saved by grace. I'm saved by grace. I said the sinner's prayer. I'm saved, so there's nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do to be saved. Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. So it says, it says that they refuse to come. So guess what? You can refuse to come to the wedding banquet. You can either choose to come, or you can refuse to come. Look what it says then. Then he sent some more servants out and said, tell those who have been invited, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fattened calf has been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention. That's one way you could not make it to the wedding banquet. Don't pay no attention to it. Just work and work and work six, seven days a week and do your own thing and live your life the way you think you should because, you know, God can't do anything to help you with your life. Just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Yep, pay no attention to it. And you won't be at the wedding banquet. The Bible says. And then he says, then went off. One to his field. In other words, his job. Let's just be real in English. One to his job. Look at one to his business. Maybe he's an entrepreneur. Maybe he owns his own business. 
See, one was a job to the fields where he worked, and one is his business. <laughs> and it says both of them right there in Scripture. So that's what people will do. That's one way you cannot be invited to the wedding banquet. And then the other seized, uh, rest, seized the service, mistreated them, and killed them. In other words, they treated the body of Christ bad. They did all kinds of different things. They persecuted the body. They persecuted us that honor God's Sabbath day on a Friday during the day. Because they said, oh, I don't, that's not true. The Jews know what to do. You do it on Friday night. That's when a day starts at night, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to even a child. But that's what people believe. People believe. <laughs> it makes no sense. But anyway, it says, mistreated and killed them. And the king, God, was enraged. He sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. So when the people that choose to um, pay no attention to God's Sabbath days and his holy days and pay no attention to the kingdom of God, what does the Bible say that God's going to do to those people? Destroy. He's going to destroy them. He's going to send his army to destroy those. And he calls them now murderers because murderers is in the same category as disobedient to the Sabbath day. Right? So whether if you're a murderer or adulterous or breaking the Sabbath day, it's all the same to God. He calls you a murderer and he's going to burn their city. That needs to be scary. That's why one of the videos you need to watch is the fear of the Lord. Having a healthy fear of the Lord is important. Look what it says. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come now. Now they can't come to the wedding banquet because they chose to ignore God's invitation. And then it says, so go to the street corners and invite the banquet. Anyone you find. In other words, we, that's why we're sharing this message. That's why we're getting these DVDs out to people and getting this information out so that somebody will watch it and say, oh my goodness, I've been wanting to know this stuff. And they repent, they get baptized. Next thing you know, they're part of the body. They're part of the wedding party. <laughs> and you that's been studying the scriptures for years and years and years are left behind and won't make it to the wedding party. But let's see if the Bible says that. I, I, that's just me. Let me just keep reading. So go to this recording and invite the banquet. Anyone you find. So the servants went out into the street and gathered all the people they could find, bad as well as good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man, they're not wearing wedding clothes. If you understand the scriptures on wedding clothes, we went over that. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The righteous acts of the saints is honoring the commandments and the holy days. That's a whole other scripture. You can watch one of the videos we mentioned earlier and get the details on that. But verse 12, it says, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? How did you get in here without honoring the commandments and the holy days and the Sabbath day? Friend, the man was speechless. Then the king told his attendants, tie him hand and foot. And throw them outside into the darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does it mean to have weeping and gnashing of teeth? Regret. Yeah, regret. Like regret. Yeah, yeah. He, he, here's what that would look like in real life, guys. Imagine on the Feast of Trumpets one year. You're not paying attention. You're ignoring his feast days. You're not coming to his Sabbath days. You don't know the holy days. So you haven't been paying attention. You've paid no attention, like the scripture said. And you went off to your business in your field. You're just working and working, not paying attention. And one day on the Feast of Trumpets, boom, at the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, thousands of people disappear or few disappear and they're gone. And you know them. Maybe they live on your street. Maybe they work with you. Maybe they are your, some of your good friends and they are gone and you're left behind. How are you going to feel? You're going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't mean you're going to hell. That just means you're going to be very sorry you didn't go. I watched a movie years ago called um, Left, Left Very good, Maddox. Awesome. Uh, Left Behind, the first one. And there was one scene in that movie. I don't remember a lot of the movie back then, but I remember one scene. It was the scene where there was a minister, a black minister, was standing in front of the room. And he was sitting there, and the screen po uh, focused in on him. And the room was empty in the church. And he got down on his knees and he was crying. And then he went up to the pulpit and said, I knew the scripture. I read it. I used to preach the word of God. I used to teach people this stuff. And they're gone and I'm not. Because I was a liar. I was deceitful. Because I knew the word, but I wasn't willing to obey it. I knew the truth and denied his power. And he was left behind. I said, I do not want that day to be me. And that's why I said, God, show me the truth. 
I want to know the truth at all costs. I don't care what I got to do. If the Sabbath, he changes it and said every Tuesday you got to do somersaults for a mile, then I got my gym clothes on and I'm somersaulting for a mile. I don't care what it takes to obey the Sabbath day because I understand that's disobedience to the commandments and it's taking the mark of the beast. So I don't care what it took. And God knew my heart, so he shared this with me. What about you? Do you have that kind of conviction or is it just, nah, when I can, I can. When I can, I can't. I got to work. I've got stuff to do. Take care of my business. You know, I got to do, do what I got to do. What's your attitude? Because it says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I do not want to not be the bride. Yes. Amen. And just to clarify for people maybe just tuning on, we mention a lot about the Sabbath because the other commandments and the first and second, most people who really love God, they automatically, they do those. I mean, we don't want to be simple. It's just that the Sabbath day is the one that we were all deceived on yeah. at one time in our lives. This is the one thing that we recognize is so important to God, and it's a sign between God and his people. That's a great point, and I'm glad you brought that up, because you're right. I, we do mention the Sabbath a lot in the Holy Days, but it's no different than murder. See, the other commandments, the other nine commandments, a good-hearted, obeying disciple of Jesus is not going to murder anyway. They're not going to have idols, you know, intentionally having idols. They're, they're going to love God with all their heart, mind, and soul, and strength anyway. They're, gonna also, they're not going to, you know, be mean to their parents. And be, you know, they're going to they're gonna do the other ten commandments automatically. The other nine commandments automatically. Satan knew that. So what did he do? He made a five-day work week. He made a, a school system, a five-day school system, so you automatically disobey one of the commandments. And the Bible says if you break one, you've broken them all. That's what the Bible says. So because of that, exactly what Jamie just said is that that's why he did that. That's why we mentioned that. But look what it says. It says many are invited and few are chosen again. So it's another big thing that we need to know about the kingdom of God is that only a few are chosen. So not only are a few invited, <laughs> guess what? A few are chosen too. So if you think that everybody in the church is going to be saved and make it into the kingdom of God, you are wrong again. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says few are chosen and few are even invited. So it's very important to understand this. You want to be on that narrow road. So the narrow road means you're one of the chosen few. That's what being on that narrow road is. So you need to know what that looks like. So those are the three points. One, you got to get eternal life. In other words, eternal life is life. That's what the Bible says. And the kingdom of heaven are all the same. It's being on that narrow road. Only a few find it. In other words, only a few are even going to see this message. There's 8 billion people on this planet. You know how many are going to see it? Very few. Why? Be just because Satan is a deceiver. Now, will they have another chance? Yes. There's two more chances if after the bride is gone. There's the wedding party that have to go through the great tribulation, get beheaded for their faith, and that's called the first resurrection. That's in Revelation 20. You can read about it. We're not going through that today. That's the second opportunity to make it. But I'd rather not get beheaded. I, I actually enjoy my head. I'd prefer not to get beheaded if I didn't have to. I'd prefer to be the bride and not have to go through that than to have to go through that and then really get my faith tested. And then the third time is when the book of life, when everyone is raised at the last day, when everyone is raised and they're judged by their life. When they're judged by their life. When that happens, that's different. I don't want to be judged by my life because I know what I did too. <laughs> and I don't want to be judged there either. So the best option for me was to be the bride. And that's just obedience. <laughs> so that's easy. That's the easiest of the three, in my opinion. So I can either obey God now, be the bride, not go through the great tribulation. Or you can go through the great tribulation, have to be tested for your faith, and be beheaded because you are obedient to God. Or you can die and then wait till a thousand years over, and then God look at the open the book and look at your life and see if you were worthy of being part of it. So all those people that they say, well, what about knowing someone that's never heard the word of God? They'll be judged by their life. Because God gives us a conscience. We're made in his image. You see, so everyone's covered. I'd just rather be the bride. That's the easiest of the three for me. Okay, so let's keep going, though. So now, he also wants us to learn the truth, right? So what truth does he want us to learn? Let's look at that. Um, let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. 
So what that's telling us is that there was false prophets back then. Do you think there's more false prophets or less now? More. The answer is thousands more. <laughs> I mean, how many denominations are there? There's over 400,000 different denominations just in the U.S. And a denomination is when someone comes up with the Bible and they put their own opinion behind it and they come up with their way of teaching it. That's what a denomination really is. They read the scripture and then they say, oh, well, I believe it says this. And then they teach that versus just reading the Bible and teaching that. That's what a denomination is over 400,000 in scripture in the, in the U.S. Just in the U.S. That's what I was told. So think about around the world. Is there this, this prophecy right here? is a prophecy about today. But there are also false te prophets among the people, just as there'll be false teachers among you, among you, among us, among all of us. And there's false teachers. Look what it says, what they'll do. And tell me if this sounds familiar. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies and even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, swiftly bringing swift destruction on themselves. Are there uh, teachers out there teaching heresy about Jesus? Absolutely. Saying Jesus, oh, Jesus was a man. There's a video, there's a movie coming out that's ridiculous that's coming out about Jesus right now. It's unbelievable what people are teaching right now. Look what it says. Here's the scary part. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, so why are they doing it? For money. So how many ministers, <clears throat> how many congregations out there are just talking about money, how great, how much money they can earn? And they're flying around in jets and got these big old houses and it's all about money. Mega churches. Mega churches. Who needs a mega church? A mega church. You, 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 by the way, there's no such thing as you go to church. You're baptized into the body of Christ. You become the church. There's no go to church. It don't even make sense. How do you go to yourself? This is the church right here. You're baptized for the forgiveness of their sin. You are baptized into the body of Christ. So this is what happens. They, in their greed, these teachers will exploit you and fab with fabricated stories. Oh, how many churches read three scriptures, tell a personal story, have some props, and that's the whole message. <laughs> We've read more scripture in this week already than most congregations read in an entire you know, six months. And we ain't even halfway done yet. So you see what I'm saying? So this is what's happening in the world. That's why God put this message on. He wants us to hear this message. He needs us to learn this information. It's a lot, but he wants us to learn it because if we don't teach it, who will? If we don't teach it, look what it says. Their condemnation has been long hanging over them and their destruction is not sleeping. Look what it says. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness, to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. You see how that happened in the flood? He killed everyone, but he protected his people. Look what it says. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them as an example of what is going to happen, to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved and conduct of lewdness for the righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lewdness, lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteousness, unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Do you guys get that? The day of trials is called the great tribulation. He holds the godly in, he put, holds the godly out of going through the trials. That's the bride. That's what I just shared. And everyone else that chose to disobey that said, ah, oh, his Sabbath days are not important. His commandments are not important. His holy days, uh, hogwash. I'm going to work what I want and I'm going to do what I want to do. Yep, and guess what it says he's going to do? You just read it. It's, this is God's word. You're not hearing me teach it. I'm just showing you the scriptures and reading through it. So it's very important to understand. This is some of the things he wants us to learn. These are the truths he wants to learn. That's the truth. What's going to happen to the ungodly? And it's by choice if you want to be the ungodly. But let's keep going. We've got a couple more on that. Let's go to Matthew. 
Matthew. Matthew 24. You know, and I, I love how God makes his messages, and I don't have control. Sometimes they're short, sometimes they're long, but you know what? I ain't got nothing else to do today. Today's a Sabbath day. <laughs> I ain't working today. What else am I going to do but learn God's word? <laughs> There's nothing more important to do. What am I going to do now? Go out and go have some fun? No, this is fun. I want to know how to be right with God. I want to know how to make it to the kingdom of God. There is nothing more important for me to be doing right now than to learn how to make it to the kingdom of God and to be teaching others the same. So let's see. Matthew 24. Look what it says. Matthew 24, starting at verse 3. It says, And Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? In other words, when are we going to go to this kingdom of God you've been talking about? That's what he's asking. So that's the same question we should be asking. When is this going to happen? Well, all the signs are here. Just look around them. Look at, read down further on the scripture. We're not going to read it today, but read down further on the scripture and you'll see all the signs and just ask yourself, are they here today? All of them are here today. And look what it says. Look at, look at Jesus' answer. One of the number one signs he says. He says, Jesus answers, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. Who is that? Those, those are pastors. Those are ministers. Those are people preaching the word of God. Those are people doing YouTube videos. Those are people preaching their own beliefs and opinions and ideas versus preaching what the scripture says. It says many are going to come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. What they're doing is they're, they're saying Jesus is Lord. They're preaching Jesus is Lord. You need to follow Jesus. So now accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're saved. Isn't that preaching Jesus' name? Isn't that preaching? Jesus is Lord? Yeah, they may say, hey, just go ahead. You don't have to obey the Sabbath day. That was nailed to a cross. But Jesus is Lord. You need to obey Jesus. That's preaching in Jesus' name. But they're deceiving many because you do got to obey the commandments. You see, oh, baptism, you don't need to be baptized to be saved. That's just an outward sign of an inward grace. You know, you're saved by faith. You're saved by faith. Nothing you can do to help you be saved. Okay, uh, but you don't have to be baptized. Well, well, the scripture says you do about 40 times. You see, that's, that's what this scripture just said. It's preaching in Jesus' name, saying Jesus is Lord, but deceiving many. How many ministers are doing that right now? How many people online are doing that right now? How many people on Facebook are doing that right now? Preaching in Jesus' name, preaching false doctrine by accident and on purpose. Amen. By both. So this is what he wants us to know. That's called the knowledge of the truth. He wants us to know these truths. He wants us to understand this. So it's very important that we grasp that. And so on Saved by Truth website, there's a lot of videos, a lot of training on uh, Bible studies on that, that teach the truth about these things. So you need to learn them. Look what it says. So what are we being saved from? So what is it that we need to be saved from? So now we know saved means being in the kingdom of heaven. Means be in the kingdom of God, right? Being on the narrow road, right? Yes. Did you have a question? No, we're just first. Well, we're first saved from ourselves, from well, our own sinful nature. Well, our own yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Being caught in our own sin. Yep, absolutely. But let's look at, this is important on this particular topic. You're right. And we're going to go through that in detail. But look at what the Bible says about that. So what do we save from? Let's look at Matthew 5, Romans 5, actually. Romans 5, we're going to start in verse 6. Romans 5, starting in verse 6, it says, You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might die, possibly might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, God died, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So what are we being saved from? God's wrath. So you understand? So all the things Jamie said about being saved from ourselves, from our sin and all, that's true. But realistically, what salvation means, we get saved from God's wrath. When does God's wrath happen? It's called the Great Tribulation. And guess what? The bride doesn't go through the Great Tribulation. 
everyone else does. The ones that are left behind, the ones that are ignoring his holy days and his Sabbath day. The one that work is more important and their business is more important and they say, oh, they pay no attention, like the scripture says. They go through the great tribulation. But the bride is saved through that. That's what it says in scripture. So which would you prefer to be? Would you prefer to go through it? Because you can, it's by choice. Just pay no attention, <laughs> right? That's it, it's real simple. Just pay no attention to what we're teaching. Watch part of this video and say, man, this is kind of busy. I, I gotta go generate some money. <laughs> go do that. Pay no attention. It's very easy to go through the Great Tribulation. Very simple. But look what it says here. That's one thing that we need to, that, um, that we're being saved from. But let's look at another one. Romans 1, Romans 1, starting at verse 18. Look what it says. The title of this area is God's Wrath Against the Sinful Humanity. <laughs> so we kind of know what he's talking about. It says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of the people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what they mean be known to God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. So let's look at the first thing he says. He said, the wrath of God is being revealed. So we're starting to see the wrath of God. Can you see the wrath of God around the world right now? Yeah. <laughs> Can you see it? Can, if you can't see it, you better open your eye. That means you're asleep. The wrath of God is being revealed right now against the godlessness. People that do less than godly things around this world and who suppress the truth. See, suppressing the truth is godlessness too. You see, he wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Satan's getting everybody to believe lies and deception. But look what it says. So since they, it since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal powers and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So everyone's without excuse that God exists and what's going on. Everyone's without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor they gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, maybe they got these prestigious jobs. Maybe they're a business owner, they're a multimillionaire, they are, they're a teacher or they're a doctor or something. They got these jobs and they think they're so wise in their own eyes. What does the Bible say? They became fools by disobedient God, being disobedient to God. But look what it says. They exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images made to look like mortal humans, being birds and animals and reptiles. So therefore, let's see what happens to those people. God gave them over to sinful desires of their heart, impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. See any of that happening going on right now in the world? Didn't the president pass a law about that a couple of years ago? Isn't that interesting? That's all around this world happening right now. And guess who gave them over to it? God did. That's called the days of Lot, you guys. That's why Lot was destroyed. Because of the same sin that the president just announced of the other year in this, in this country and around the world. The days of Lot. So for the first time in history, we're in the days of Lot and in the days of Noah, simultaneously. All the signs are here. Look what it says. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and cre served created things like money, like themselves, like American idols, served people. They, they, everything became more important than God. Isn't it? Do you see that right now today? Yeah, everything is more important. Look what it says. And worshiped and cre served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, see, because people want to serve other gods and, and because they want to, you know, all the different things they talked about, is that God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relationships with other ones. See any of that happening right now? At the highest rate in history, by far. Look what it says. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed for lust with one another. And you see any of that going on right now? At the highest rate in history, men committed shameful acts with other men and received themselves due punishment for their error. Again, 
God had given them over to it because that's what they wanted. He said, fine, just like he did with the Israelites. Watch last week's message. We talked about how he divorced the Israelites and gave them over, took away their holy days and their Sabbath days because they didn't want to honor him anyway. So he said, fine, go worship other gods. And he divorced them. Just like you would do if you divorced your husband or your wife. Right? You'd say, go ahead and do whatever you want to do now because you don't care. You understand? That's how God treated them, and that's how he's treating people today, in the same way. Look what it says. Furthermore, they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. Did you guys hear what I just said? I said, he, that the people didn't think it was worthwhile to gain this knowledge. So they didn't take notes. They didn't pay attention. They didn't go research the scriptures. They didn't become a disciple. You know what they did? They just listened to the message just like in every other church. Watch the billboard, watch the big screen, and then go home on their merry way and do whatever they want to do. Right? See, they didn't think it was worthwhile to gain the knowledge. Okay? So God gave them over. <laughs> now all these people, see, he's given everybody over to it. He gave, them, gave it over to them, the people that don't think it's important to gain the knowledge. To depraved mind. So that they do, not do what they ought not to be done. They have become with every kind of weakness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are filled with envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossipers, slanderers, God haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. It sound like today? It sound like the people today, every time you turn on the news, crazy stuff going on in the news. At, at, unbelievable stuff people are doing to their parents and the kids. And it's crazy. It's crazy. But look why it's happening. Although they knew God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Not only do they do it, they say, yeah, that's good. Let's go watch a movie about that. Let's go do, some, you know what I'm saying? And that's what's happening today. That's today. That's not back then. That's now. This is what's happened in the last days. So you got to understand, that's what we're being saved from. And that's how it is right now with the body of Christ on the, on the earth. What happens when the bride's gone? When the bride's gone, boom, at a twinkle of an eye at the last trump on the Feast of Trumpets. When that's gone and you're left behind, what's the world going to look like then? <laughs> what's the world going to look like when there's no one preaching the word of God? When this, these videos can't be on the internet, so you better own a CD. You better own one of those DVDs. You better have it burned on your cell phone. You better have it hidden away so it act like it's gold, because that's the truth of what the Bible teaches. When all the Bibles are taken away and it's illegal to have one like it was years ago in Germany at one point, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah when that starts to happen because the bride is gone and only people left are the people that love God but was refused to obey. Now what's going to be like? You understand? Are you getting this? I hope you're grasping this concept because God wants you to know this message. So how do we make it to the kingdom of God? So let's talk about some instruction, some specific things of what we need to do. Number one. First Corinthians, we're going to go through some of these pretty quick. First Corinthians 6, <laughs> First Corinthians 6, <laughs> look what it says. First Corinthians 6, starting in verse 14, it says, By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. When does that happen? On the Feast of Trumpets, the dead in Christ rise first. Those who are alive remain, get to be caught up to go meet the Lord in the air. We'll be with him forever. That's when that's going to happen. Look what it says. Do, not, do you not know that your bodies are a member of Christ himself? Shall then I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Well, biblically speaking, what does that mean? What does that mean? What is a spiritual prostitute? It's, it, it's a false church. It's false teaching. It's false doctrine. False doctrine is what he's talking about. It's not talking about a physical woman. It's talking about the woman, the fake church, the one that's a big one that we read the other day. It's on the church on Seven Hills. 
Where is that located? If you look at, if you look back in history, if you look at the doctrine and what's been taught, even all the Christian churches, where it came from, the origin is from that church. You understand? And you'll see that in scripture. But it, look what it says. Do you not know that he unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? So in other words, if you decide that you want to go hang out in some other congregations that are teaching false doctrine, you've, uni you've unified yourself with it. That's what it says. For it says, the two will become one flesh. <laughs> That's the same thing. But whoever unites with the Lord is one with him in spirit. <clears throat> Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? That's why we're not waiting for some temple in Jerusalem to be built, some third temple. That's a whole other deception. We are the temple. We're being built up right now. That's what it's saying. That's what this whole message is for. We're building the temple right now. That's why you should get these videos out. Put these videos out. Put these DVDs and CDs out. Buy one, buy one or some and get them out. Have other people order them so they can learn this message. You are the temple of God. Who is in you, whom you have received from God. And when did we receive it? At baptism. baptism. Look what it says. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So once you got your sins forgiven, you got baptized, you're not your own anymore. The way you want to live ain't yours no more. The, the things that you want to do ain't yours no more. If God tells you to get a different job, then that's what you got to do. If, if God says you need to do something different in business, then that's what you got to do. If God tells you to live somewhere different, then that's what you got to do. You ain't yours no more. You were bought at a price. That's why God tells me to do whatever. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm doing. It's not up for debate anymore because my body is God, Christ's body now. Look what it says. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. 1 Corinthians 6, 6, 14 through 18. It's so awesome how when you read scripture, it has this layer that is the first layer of just, you read it and it's like just sexual immorality. That's what it's talking about. But it really has a hidden meaning behind it about the being yoked together within the body of Christ with, you know, it's actually such a deeper meaning than what it appears. That's right. So we shouldn't be yoked together with people teaching false doctrine. We shouldn't be yoked together with that. So if you're yoked together with a group of people that are teaching false doctrine, either teach them the truth, or you got to go. That's what I did. That's what we did. We were going to a congregation. We loved our friends and family. We had been baptized there years and years and years for years. And, and all of a sudden, God started sharing with us about the Sabbath day. We were excited. We took the message to them and said, look at what we've learned. They said, ah, oh, that's nailed to a cross. You ain't got to do that. What do you mean we ain't got to do that? That's what it says. I got 190 scriptures showing we have to do that. Nope, that was nailed to a cross. Can you show me a scripture on that? No. They, they didn't want to hear that. So you know what we did? We said, hey, we got to go. Now, that took a couple months, but we had to make a decision. Are we going to follow Christ or are we going to follow what the teacher says, what the minister said? And we follow God. We follow what he said. So let's look at a couple more scriptures of what it takes to make it to the kingdom of God. John 15, we're getting into how to make it now. We know um, some of the things, but let's look at John 8, starting at verse 31 and 32. John 8, starting at verse 31 and 32. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him. We're Abraham's descendants that have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we'll be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now if a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So the next thing is, you've got to look at being free. So salvation means being free from sin. Right? So that's part of that salvation. That's what You, you have to be freed from sin to enter the kingdom of heaven. This, he ain't going to let a bunch of sinners that are all full of sin into the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't make sense. But what it says here, it says the first thing you have to do is hold to his teaching. Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciple. If you're going to go to that false church's teaching, and you're going to hold to that teaching, then you're their disciple. 
If you hold to some minister that teaches something different than the scripture, then you're their teaching. You're following their teaching. Then you're their disciple. Satan has disciples too. If you follow deceptive teaching like the, pre the ministers and people that it said in scripture, if you're following their teaching, then you're their disciple. That's how it works. That's what a disciple is, a follower. But Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciple. Then you'll know the truth. So you got to hold to the teaching first. Then you know the truth. You don't just know the truth. You know the truth by holding to the teaching. And then you will be freed from sin, which is what we'll talk about in a moment. You understand? So that's, the, that's one of the things we got to do. We got to be a disciple of Jesus and hold to his teaching. Let's keep going. Let's go to Matthew 28, 16. This is after Jesus died and rose again. Look what it says. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee on the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped. But some doubt it. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Jesus rose from the dead. They see him and they still doubt. <laughs> is this, Satan is crafty. If Jesus was here with holes in his hand is right there in front of you after he died. How do you doubt? But the Bible says they still doubt it. And these were the 11 disciples. These weren't even people that weren't disciples. These are the disciples that doubt it. So you think you're going to have doubt now? Oh, definitely. <laughs> and it, it's the same thing. Think about that. But That's right. Look what it says. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Number one, if you want to get into the kingdom of God, you've got to become a disciple. And we baptize disciples. That's what it says. And then it says, In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. You're baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Holy Spirit, then teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. What did Jesus tell them? What was his commandments to the disciples? What did he teach them? Obey the commandments. You see, so you, not only you have to become a disciple, you get baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, and then you hold on to the commandments. Amen. You hold on to the commandments. And that's what it says. And then he says, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So that's another thing we have to do. We have to become a disciple. Let's look at Mark 3. By the way, I know this is a long message. If you have to go to the restroom, just go. Come on back. We ain't got time to stop because God wants this on recording. God wants people to hear this message. God's people want to live this message. And I'm sorry, I didn't plan on doing this. But I'll tell you what. What else you got to do today? <laughs> What's more important? <laughs> Nothing, right? So you know what you do? Suck it up. Just take some notes. Be excited because God's revealing to you what it takes to make it to the kingdom of heaven. There's no more important message. So let's go to Mark 16. Mark 16. Look what it says. Mark 16, starting in verse. Yep, we'll start in verse 16. It says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Stop right there. So that's another thing you got to do is believe. You got to believe what you're hearing. You got to believe the message. You got to believe what Jesus is telling you. But it says believe and be baptized will be saved. Both. So people that teach you that you don't need to be baptized. Well, the Bible just says something different. You got to believe and be baptized will be saved. So salvation has to do with being in the kingdom of God. So that's another thing you got to do. You got to believe and be baptized. Let's keep going, though. The next scripture. I don't know why God wanted all these scriptures in one video, but he did. So, amen. It's not my job to rewrite his message. So, John 3, studying what it says. This is John 3, starting at verse 1. Look what it says. Now, a Pharisee, a man of Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we don't know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you were doing if God were not with them. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one could see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. So you think you're going to make it to the kingdom of God without being baptized? You're wrong again. You got to be born again. And it says, how can someone be born? When they are old, Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time in a mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. Now, uh, I, I want to show you a picture of what that looks like because 
A lot of people don't know what that may look like, so I'm going to show you right here on the screen what it looks like. Born again. Jesus is on the cross. What happened? There it is. It says, Jesus is on the cross. Your old life. It says, Jesus died and was buried. That's you are buried with Christ in baptism. You, Jesus was resurrected, rose from the dead. You raised from a new life. That's what baptism looks like in a graphic. Your old life in Jesus, parallel. You died, you were buried. Jesus was died, was buried. He rose to a new life. You were born again. That's what baptism looks like. That's what it means to be born again. You don't just accept Jesus as your holy savior to be, to be saved. There's no scripture on that. That's man-made. That's, that that's man-made. So you don't read, you don't, that's not how it's done. You understand? Look at another one. Acts 2.38. We're going to look at this. Same thing. Death, burial, and resurrection. You're born again. So you got to understand that. It's very important to understand what baptism and born again looks like from God's perspective. So let's go now. Let's keep going. So let's keep going to scripture now. You must be born again. The next scripture we're going to look at is Acts 2. What we just looked at in scripture, we're going to read it in the Bible. Acts 2. Acts 2, starting in verse 36. Acts 2, starting in verse 36. It says, now this is right after Jesus died, and he rose again. He died, he rose again, and now Peter's preaching to the world. It says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Right? What should we do to be saved? That's what they're asking. That's what you should be asking. What should we do to be saved? Look what he says. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the answer. Repent. That means turn away from your sin. Stop sinning. Get away from your sin. Stop doing what you've been doing. Number one, and be baptized. In other words, wash your sins away. Look what it says. And he tells it to do for every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So baptism is for the forgiveness of your sin. Remember, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. It's impossible. And it says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's when you receive that gift. Yes, is it a free gift? Of course it's a free gift. You can't earn it. But you do got to get baptized to get it. You got to do something for it. So the, the, what you have to do is you got to believe in Jesus. You got to follow his teaching. You got to become a disciple and you got to get baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. But look who it says it's for. This prom, the promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far off. Here's the key for all whom the Lord God will call. Many are called, few are chosen. So many are called to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sin and few will even find it like it said in scripture. So in other words, it's going to be very few in the kingdom of heaven because there's millions that have been taught. All you got to do is say this sinner's prayer. Whatever that is, there's no such thing as a sinner's prayer in the scripture. But they tell you to say it and that's how you get saved and get your sins forgiven. Wrong. There's no scripture on that. They say you got to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's no scripture on that. You got to you got to just believe and be saved. You got to have faith and be saved. All these ways to be saved. No, the Bible's telling you right now, repent and be baptized every one of you for in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And look what he says. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, "Save yourself from this corrupt generation." And I'm doing the same thing right now. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Save yourself. I thought you didn't have to do anything. Well, you do. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. You have the opportunity to be the bride. You have the opportunity to save yourself. I'm begging you, watch these videos, study this material, and save yourself from this corrupt generation. Look what it says, though. Here's the whole key. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Which means a lot of them didn't accept that message. A lot of them paid no attention, like I said earlier, and went off to their business, went off to their work, went off to their beautiful lifestyle, went off to their family, went off and did something else. They paid no attention. 
but the only ones that became part of the body were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to that number that day. There was probably five or 10 or 15 or 20,000 people there. Do you know that on the, the, the Pentecost tomorrow, the day the Holy Spirit came down, that was this day. This day was that feast. That's why they were all there. They were there celebrating the Feast of Pentecost. In Noah's day, I'm sorry, in, in Moses' day, when Moses went up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, they were having a party down in the bottom. They were having sin down at the bottom. They were having, you know, a, 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 a big old golden calf and having a big old party and all kinds of stuff. And guess what God did on that day? He killed 3,000 people that day in Noah's day. Guess what he did in the New Testament in this day? 3,000 were born again that day. That's how we honor that feast tomorrow. Awesome. You understand? It was a fulfillment of prophecy. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. He killed 3,000 in the New Testament. He brought 3,000 back and showed them the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And now he's showing it to you right now. He's showing it to you on this video. He's showing it to you in this room. The only question is, are you going to accept that message? Are you going to accept the message of what it takes to make it to the kingdom of heaven? What God is teaching you in this message? Because you don't have to, just like some of them didn't have it, because it is a narrow road and most people won't find it. It's by choice. You can stay on the wide road, the one everyone else tells you to do. You can choose to do that. It's by choice. But don't expect to be in the kingdom of heaven, because you won't be based on the scriptures. So let's keep looking, though, because God's trying to drill this in, you guys. <laughs> he wants you to get it. So there's no misunderstanding. Say, oh, I didn't understand. Uh, you, you understand this. Let's keep going. Look what it says. Romans 6, starting in verse 1. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on saying that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Again, that's baptism. That's dying and raising again. We just saw the picture on that. So that's what that means. Again. So how many times does it need to say you need to be born again? Once. He just showed it to you multiple times. Here's another thing the Bible says you have to do. Matthew. Matthew 19. I think we may have gone through this again. But we're going to go through just part of it. Matthew 19 because again remember being saved is having you you got to have your sins forgiven it's being part of the kingdom of God right Matthew 19 look what it says we talked about this earlier but we're going to just go through one small part Matthew 19 starting in verse 16 Matthew 19 starting in verse 16 look what it says a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Isn't that what we're asking? Don't you want to know the answer to that question? Well, you, well we just showed you. You've got to be baptized, right? Well, no one into the kingdom of God unless they're born again. You've got to hold to Jesus' teaching. That's another thing you've got to do, right? Right? What else did it say you have to do? You have to repent, right? You have to be born again. That's what it says. But let's show you something else that is not being taught right now in Scripture. Let's look at what else it says. He says, why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. What it says, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Let me let you simmer on that a little bit. If you want to enter life, keep the Ten Commandments. That's what that said. Well, if you don't believe they're the Ten Commandments, he says which ones? He didn't believe it either. He didn't know which ones either. So he says, Jesus, do not murder. That's one in the Ten Commandments. Do not commit adultery. You, uh, you do not steal. You understand? So we went through this already. I got that. But what does it say? It says, keep the commandments. So bottom line is, one of the things to make it to the kingdom of God is you got to keep the commandments. And if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. Based on the scriptures, you may as well murder. If, if you decide to dishonor God on, in, and have idols, you may as well murder. What's the difference to God? If you decide to disobey your parents or, you know, you know, not honor your parents, then you may as well be coveted with money and, and gold and silver and everything. It's no different, right? It's the same. They're all in the same Ten Commandments. If you want to have idols, no, go ahead. Just don't disobey the Sabbath day. It's the same thing. They're all in the same Ten Commandments. No difference. 
Because sin is sin to God and it all separates us from God. That's right. Because sin separates us from God. And from God's perspective, sin is sin. That's right. Let's keep going, though. John 14. Look what it says in John 14. John 14, starting in verse 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commands. Now, if you translate that to the, NI, to the King James Version, it'll say commandments. Just so you understand, commands and commandments mean the same thing. If you love me, keep my commandments. So if you love Jesus, you'll do what? His keep his commandments. All 10 of them or nine of them or eight of them? All 10. All 10. So if you don't love him, what won't you do? Don't you won't keep his commandments. So don't tell Jesus you love him and did not obey his commandments. Because that's telling him you don't love him. You understand? How can you say, I love Jesus, and then go murder? Can you do that? No, that's called a hypocrite. Right? No, if you, if you say, I love Jesus, I really love Jesus, but have idols all over your house. What would Jesus say? He say, I don't know you. So what would you do if, if you, you say, I love Jesus and decide I'm going to work on his Sabbath day? What would he say? I don't, I don't know you. Same thing. It's the same. You get it? So let's keep reading, though. You don't have to believe me and take my word for it. Let's read. And I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, but it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you when do you get that spirit in you baptism. baptism i will not leave you as orphans i will come to you before long the world will not see me anymore but you will see me because i live and you also will live on that day you will realize that i'm in the father and you are in me and i am with you Listen to what it says. Whoever obeys my commandments and keeps them. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. <clears throat> so who does Jesus say loves him? Those who keep, has his commandments and keeps them. Not just knows about them. Not just read them. Not just has a picture on the wall of the commandments. No, who has them and keeps them is the one who loves him. And then the Father's love will be with you. Do you get that? So it's not just being baptized. You can be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin and go right through the great tribulation and get your head lopped off. You understand that? I hope you guys reading this, listen to this message on this video. I hope you get this. Because the ones who love him are those who obey his commandments. That's what the Bible says. Can you make it to the kingdom of heaven without loving Jesus? Can you? No. And guess what Jesus considers loving him? Obeying his commandments. <laughs> you get it? See how it all ties together? So this is a great message for you. It's a great message for all of us because it tells us exactly what to do. Let's keep going though. Let's go to 1 John. I put John, but it's actually 1 John 4. You can put a correction on that. 1 John 4. 1 John 4. Let's read what it says. 1 John 4. We're going to start in verse 1. <clears throat> Dear friends, do not believe every spirit but test the spirit to see if they were from God. <laughs> oh, man. Look at what that says. This is very important to get, you guys. You know, people say, oh, I have the Holy Spirit. I, I listen to the spirit. I had a guy on YouTube. I'm te teaching him about baptism. I'm showing him scripture after scripture. You know what he says? Well, I listen to the Holy Spirit. He's listening to a spirit. But that don't mean it's the spirit of God. You understand? Because he doesn't believe baptism is for the forgiveness of sin. So if you don't believe the baptism is for the forgiveness of sin, that means you probably haven't had your sins forgiven. That means you probably don't have the Holy Spirit. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're listening to a spirit, is it a spirit of God? No. Probably not. And the Bible just said so. You understand? Look what it says. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. 
but test the spirit to see if whether if it's from God, because many because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And it tells you how to recognize it. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus is Christ have come in the flesh and is born from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. That spirit is from the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. The Antichrist was in the world back then. Do you think it's more prevalent now? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them, them, the false spirits that are out there. The world's listening to all those false spirits, teach all that false doctrine. We are from God. Listen to what it says. He who knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Guess who he's talking about right there? You. See, people that are from God will listen to us because they see the scriptures. They're hearing the truth. They learn about, they hear about baptism. And they're excited to learn about it. The Bible says people that are not from God don't listen to them and they probably won't listen to us either because they don't believe baptism for forgiveness of sin, which means they don't have the Holy Spirit. They've not been born again. So because they don't have that spirit, they can't discern. They're listening to a different spirit. That's what the Bible just said. But look what it says. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Yes. It's just interesting. Can you, look, Stephen. So it's interesting to me because the, um, it, it just seems like in a lot of these scriptures, it's more prevalent that he's so speaking of the occult. Right. And of all the, you know, like they suppress uh -huh. the, of the truth. They're but, the ones who have the ability to suppress the truth of which when we obey the commandments, God like ripped open our vision to see everything that they deceived the world on. And I think even in this, it's it's talking being what like they speak of a viewpoint of the world. Right. You know, like they're speaking for and we all were like on under this ether of them. That's right. Until we came out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, like Babylon basically. Yeah, in other words, we came out of that by obedience. Right. When you're obedient, you can see the truth because God reveals it to you. So let's keep reading though. Let's you're gonna see how powerful this is as the scripture goes. Dear friends, let us love one another, for God comes from love comes from God. So write that down. God, love comes from God. This is very important. Everyone who loves has been born of God. And God know, and, and knows God. Everyone, I'm sorry, whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. So now he's tying loving God. Remember what Jesus said, if you love me, what? You'll, you'll keep his commandments. So now he's tying love with knowing God. So if you know God, you'll love God. And if you love God, you'll keep his commandments, right? Yeah. All tied together. But look at what it says. This is how God shows his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. So by God showed his love to us by sending him his son so he could die for us, right? Not that we love God, but that God loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for sin through baptism. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also also love one another. So now we need to be loving each other. And that's why we need to come fellowship with each other, each other. That's why we need to share this message and be loving one another. Not just the world, not loving the world. The Bible says don't love the world. He says we need to be loving each other. <clears throat> Look what it says. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and love is made complete in us. So how do we love one another? Because the church I used to go to, they used to always preach that. Whenever we show about the commandments, you know what they'd say? Yeah, but it's just loving each other. It's loving the brother. It's the number one commandment. You got to love the brothers. I had a brother over one night till four in the morning just telling us, you just got to love one another. We're strong. Loving God is, is what this says. No, no, you just got to love the brothers. It's just love, love. We're like, okay, fine. We, we can't even argue about this point no more. But let's see what the Bible says. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us the spirit. And we have seen and testified the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And we know that we rely on God's love, uh, the love of God has for us. 
Let's, this is powerful. Look what it says. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Right? In this world, we are like Jesus. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Why don't you have to worry about punishment from God, his wrath? Why don't you have to be fearful of that if you love God the way he tells you to love him? Why? You, because you won't be here. The bride won't go through wrath. <laughs> so you won't be, there's no reason to be afraid. I'm not afraid of the great tribulation at all because I'm obedient to God. Now, can God allow me to go through it if he wants to? Sure he can, but he promises he won't. And I believe his promises. Look what it says. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. In other words, the one who fears is probably not obedient to his commandments. <laughs> right? Let's keep reading though. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Whoever does not love his brother or sister from who he has seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this commandment. Anyone who loves God must also love his brother. Listen to what this says. This is so cool. So you see how that works? How God is tied loving the brothers and loving God simultaneously? Look what it says. This is John 5. First John. John 5, look what it says in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the child as well, this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commandments. So how do we know we love the children of God? By carrying his commandments. And in fact, this is love for God. To keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So you understand? Loving God and loving the brothers and sisters is keeping his commandments. That's what that means. So not only do we have to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, not only do we have to repent, not only do we have to hold to Jesus' teaching, not only do we have to believe in Jesus and become a disciple of Christ, we have to obey his commandments, all ten of them. Yes? not burdensome. They, 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 if you're not loving him, it's a burden to, to follow his commandments. If you're loving him, it's, it comes naturally to follow. That's right. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. We got just a couple more scriptures here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6. So what do we do? How do we prepare ourselves? And what do we do from this point? So we know what we got to do now, right? So look at one of the things it says. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 9. Look what it says. <clears throat> or do you know that wrongdoers will not enter the kingdom of God? Now do you know that? You guys didn't know it before, you know now, right? If you didn't know, now you know. <laughs> that used to be a song back in the day. <laughs> if you didn't know, now you know. That wrongdoers will not enter the kingdom of God. You're not in the kingdom of God now, and you will never enter the kingdom of God if you're a wrongdoer. Look what it says. <clears throat> Do not be deceived. So don't deceive yourself thinking that wrongdoers will enter the kingdom of God, because they won't, based on the scriptures. Do not be deceived, neither sexual or moral, immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who do what it says there in scripture, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourself, you guys. If you guys are living like this, and this is talking to the church at that time, remember? So I'm talking to you. You say you're a believer of Jesus, you're watching this video, you say you're a believer of Jesus, great. Are you living like this? Because it says you will not enter the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourself. Look what it says. And that's what some of you were. I know that's what I was. I was a few of those things in there. You pick out yourself on that list. Which ones were you? You were probably some of those. But look what it says. But you were washed when you were sanctified. When did that happen? Baptism. At baptism. When you washed your sins away. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus, Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. By the spirit of our God. 
So it's very important you understand. That's one of the things we've got to make sure we do. Amen. We come out from them. Let's keep reading, though. Revelation 18. It says, now this is an interesting scripture. It's going to show you what that false church looks like. That's been teaching so much doc false doctrine. Look what it says. As you're reading this, I want you to think about what church this could look like. Just, just listen to the scripture and think about who this could represent in the world today. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. It had great authority and the earth was illuminated. Interesting word, isn't it? By his splendor, with a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen, Babylon, Babylon the great. She, a false church is always a she, has become a dwelling for demons, a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk of the madness, maddening of wine of her adulteries. We talked about that last week. Drunk on the wine of the saints and the blood of the saints because of how many people that church has killed over the years. But it says they're drunk on the false doctrine of it as well. The kings of this earth committed adultery with her. In other words, believed her teachings. The kings of this world. So what church run the kings of this world? Ask yourself the question. And the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. What church has excessive luxuries like gold and silver? Has money coming out of the, their ears? Who has more? What church has more money on the planet than anyone? Because the merchants of the church grew rich from her adulteries. Look what it says. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her. So you think it's talking about what if you don't belong to the church? You belong to one that it's taught their teachings. What should you do? Come out, come out of her. My people. So he's only talking to us, the people that want to obey God, the ones that want to make it to the kingdom of heaven. He said, come out. If it's teaching something different than what you just learned or what you're learning in the scriptures, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. YouTube it, Google it. This church has killed more people on the planet than anyone, any military group, anyone over the history of time. So you need to find out who that is. Look at it says, give back to her as she has given. Pay back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief, grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart, she boasts and sit a throne as queen who sits above on a throne. What, 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 uh, what person does that? You tell me, you know, the scriptures, you know, what's going on in the world. Go look it up. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore in one day, her plagues will overtake her death, mourning and famine. She will be consumed by fire for mighty is the Lord. God who judges her. The Bible just told us we need to come out of false doctrine of her or her little children churches that are out there and, uh, you know, and the false ministers and preachers that are teaching false doctrine. Now, some may be doing it by accident, but some are doing it on purpose. Look it up. Look up what's called the, uh, um, the, the, the Jesuits. Look that up and see what they teach. Look what they've been taught. Just look it up for yourself. You don't have to believe me. Just go look it up for yourself. YouTube it. Google it. It's all there. But it's so important for us to understand. The Bible says we need to come out of that. Because who's not going to enter the kingdom of God? We know some of the things. But let's look at this. This is, I'm sorry, guys, but God, God has poured it on today. Yes. Um, it's funny because if you read down, and this is just so true of, of how Satan works, but in verse 15, uh -huh. um, it, or I'm sorry, Wait, 15, is that, is that, what, what scripture are we at? Where you were at, just Revelation, Revelation 18, verse 16. Revelation 18. Is so, it, Revelation 18, look what it says. This is awesome. Go ahead. Verse 16. 
Starting in verse 16, look what it says. Now it's even going to give you a description of what this looks like. Do you want to read? But, but yeah, but it's interesting. It says, and cry out, woe, woe to, to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. And it's interesting because it's just complete opposite of the bride, because the bride is also dressed in fine linen. Like, the, the, you know, they're dressed in clothing and a certain... And, and it's complete opposite. It's a fine linen, but it's the, the false... Glittering the with false, gold. Right. It's just a totally... It's exactly how Satan works. Yeah, that's it's awesome. The opposite of God. You're exactly right. I didn't even think about that. But yeah, so looking at that scripture, it says, Woe to you, great city. First of all, it's a city. So what church is a city at the same time? Uh, I heard one called the city on the seven hills. So look it up. It's actually in scripture. But it says, this great church is dressed in fine linen, just like the bride is dressed in fine linen. The real church is dressed in fine linen. The, the false bride is dressed in fine linen. But the difference is this one has purple and scarlet. Go look and see online and see what color their outfits are, if it's purple and scarlet. And glittering with gold. Gold everywhere. Precious stones. Uh-huh. And pearls. Look what it says. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Wow. That's awesome to see. So you see how God's word will answer uh, all of those things? That, it's just amazing, you guys. Billions. No, it has in the billions now. Yeah, so, so who will not enter the kingdom of heaven? Who will not? Well, let's look at some specific things about your life because we need to know some of the things that we need to not do. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 9. This is very important. Look what it says. We're just going to read them through real quick, just so you can have this for your own knowledge. Because God obviously wanted you to have this one message that clears up a lot of little deception there. It says, who, it says, or do you know that the wrongdoers will not enter the kingdom of heaven, into the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexual immoral, immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, or slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. One group of people. All these things are not going to enter the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible says. Let's look at another one. That the Bible says, who will not enter the kingdom of God. And if you notice, it says, do not be deceived. So people think that, oh, you can do whatever you want after you're saved. Once saved, always saved, which is the most ridiculous thing ever. Once saved, always saved. It's not true, but people believe it. Look what it says in Galatians 5.19. Here's another group that it says will not enter the kingdom of God. Let's read it. It says 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Again, sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and alike. I warn you. As I did before, that those who live like this will not enter the king, inherit the kingdom of God. That's a whole other group of people. So if you live like this, you're watching this video, and that's how you live, the Bible says don't be deceived. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Here's another group. This is the last one on this. But there's many other groups like this. Let's look at Ephesians. E Ephesians. Five. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 1. Look what it says. Follow God's example. Whose example should we be following? God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the ways of love. In other words, obedience to the commandments. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. We just read that in 1 John. But among you, there should be not even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenities, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which is out of place, but rather thanksgiving. This is what this says. For this you can be sure. This is telling you to listen up. For no, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, because such of such things 
God's wrath comes to those who are disobedient. God's wrath comes to those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not partner with them. I know this is a tough message. I know God's laying it on. But there's a reason, because he's coming to get his bride and he's coming soon on the Feast of Trumpets. We don't know what Feast of Trumpets. We pray to God that this is the Feast of Trumpets this year. We know he's coming on a feast. Those, we just don't know which one. For those who have done a lot of this, or any of this, is that they can be forgiven, truly forgiven, if they repent of their sins, and if they are then baptized again. Amen. So if you've done any of this stuff, that's what baptism is for, to forgive you of your sins. The first will be last, the last will be first. That's exactly right. So if you are watching this, and you're full of sin, maybe you're on the street right now, maybe you're a mess right now, you're not, it's not too late. Jesus said he sent his people out to the poor and the, the, the good as well as the bad. And you know what? You might be the worst sinner right now. But you know what? Repent. Make a decision to follow Jesus. Decide to obey his commandments. It's all about the heart. Get your sins forgiven. Go get baptized for the forgiveness in your sin because the Bible says the first will be last and the last will be first. There will be people watching this message right now that have been studying the scriptures for 30, 40 years, that have grown up in the scriptures, that have been watching it for years and years and years and says, ah, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And they've been deceived and they will not repent. They will not obey the commandments. And the Bible says if you don't obey God, you will not make it to the kingdom of heaven. And the first will be last and the last will be first. So don't think it's too late. It's not too late. Today is the day to get your sins forgiven if you haven't got your sins forgiven. Not tomorrow, right now. Today. Make a decision to become a disciple. Make a decision to hold on to Jesus' teaching. Not my teaching, not some man's teaching. You take the scriptures I'm giving you and you look at the scriptures in your Bible. That's what God wants you to do because he's coming. He's coming. I'm telling you, he's coming. And he's coming soon. We don't know the exact feast. We don't know the year, but we know the day because he's told us. Amen. Amen. Let's keep going. We got two more scriptures left. So what do we have to look forward to? Why should we do this? Why? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13. It says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you gr do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. I had a friend of mine the other day just call me and said her mom died. And it was really sad. It was really sad for a couple reasons. One, because you know, it took her a few months to overcome this grief of her parents' death, of her mom's death. But her and her husband were talking, and, and they comforted each other. And they comforted each other because they believed that their mom is in heaven in a better place. That's what she said. Said, so we can get away with this, and, and her, her mom is in a better place, so that's how she can do it. She still misses her, but she's so grateful that her mom is in a, in a better place in heaven. And I didn't say a word. I just listened. Because the Bible says that no one's in heaven. No one's in heaven right now. No one's in heaven. And the world is griefing because they have no hope. That's the only hope they can have that their mom is in heaven. But she's not. And neither is my grandmother and my Greek grandmothers. They're all asleep, like the Bible says. They're asleep in death. No one goes to heaven when they die. No one goes to hell when they die. They're asleep until judgment. And you're going to either be raised to life or you're going to be asleep for a thousand years until you're judged by the book of life. No one's in heaven. And I couldn't bear to tell her. That's why I was so sad, because I sat there. And I wanted to, but I couldn't, just because she was just so grieved. I, it, amen. God, I needed you to share that one. Maybe she'll get this CD one day. But look what it says, brothers and sisters. We don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. God doesn't want you to be uninformed either. That there's an opportunity. It says, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who had fallen asleep in him. So those who were a disciple of Jesus, when he comes, those are going to arise. Look what it says. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left into the coming of the Lord. That's called the Feast of Trumpets. 
That's what we're waiting for. We'll certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And that's what we're doing right now, you guys. God shared this message with us so that we could be with him and we can know we're going to be with him forever. Amen. That's why he did this. That's why this message is here. He did it, and that's called the Feast of Trumpets. That's what we're waiting for. Revelation 3. Revelation 3 7. This is why we're doing what we're doing, you guys, to be the bride. You want to be the bride. You don't want to go through the Great Tribulation. God just showed you how to be the bride. And here's the benefit of it. Here's what we receive. The Revelation 3, starting in verse 7. It says, to the angels in the church of Philadelphia. Right. These are the words of him who are holy and true, who holds the keys of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. The Bible says that Jesus is going to make the people that call themselves Jews. Find out who's running that real church. Find out in the last days when Jesus died. It was the Holy Roman Empire. And see was there, who were the people that were there. Look at the little hat that they wear. And compare that to another group of people that wear that same hat. There's only one group of people on this planet that worship in synagogues. And those are the only people that call themselves Jews. But the Bible says that God's going to have them come and fall down at your feet and say that I loved you. Those who... Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Amen. So we can make it to the kingdom of God so we will never leave it. And we'll be a pillar in the kingdom of heaven with Jesus. I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to close it out with a prayer. Father, I just want to thank you so much for this message. Thank you so much for being here for us today, God, and, and allowing us to go through this message. There was nothing more important in this world, nothing more important for us to do today, nothing more important than to be here and hear this message, God. Thank you so much. I pray this message gets anointed by you and that people all around the world will buy this CD or buy these DVDs or download the video or whatever it takes for them to be able to listen to it. God, I pray millions and millions listen to it so that even though a few was eight in Noah's day. A few could be a million or two million or five million here. God, we know that you want all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So I pray that you take this message along with the others that you've taught and spread this far and wide. And I pray that the brothers and sisters could help uh, plant the seed in their farms as well. Thank you so much for the rest of this day. And we love you so much. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.